Okay, so first of all, is anybody that doesn't understand the Italian here? Okay, I'm going to do it in English, no more. Just to, ev to evaluate, because speaking in English in front of a plateau of Italians is not very fun for anybody. But uh, thank you for being here. Uh, just a little presentation of myself. I'm Enrico uh, Cagliani, I'm an associate professor at the uh, Department of Electronics, Information and Bioengineering. I am a biomedical engineer. I got the uh, degree in electronic engineer and then a PhD in biomedical engineer here. And then during my curricula, I did uh, a, a year outside the US working in uh, University of Chicago as a visiting a researcher. And uh, if you read my presentation, it happened that I had the opportunity to participate also to an astronaut selection that uh, was done in 2001, 2002 in Italy. And uh, uh, I was lucky enough to arrive to the finals. But then if I'm here, some, something meaning in, is meaning, right? So, well, actually, nobody was selected. And uh, I'm not going through this, but if you're interested later, uh, I can talk more about this. So my presentation is about uh, what, uh, uh, in particular, in my group, uh, I've done in the last 15 years. But I will, I will try to give uh, a uh, hint of what does it mean making biomedical research for space. Because I think uh, your background uh, is not, or at least for some, only for a few people, only a few of you are biomedical engineers. So just to understand, biomedical engineers, hands up. OK. As expected. Great. So don't worry, everybody will understand. So just a, a brief uh, introduction of what is expecting us in terms of uh, exploration of the outside of the Earth orbit. So right now, the research is all focused on the ISS, as uh, you may know. Uh, but uh, we are starting uh, phase one, which means uh, to build a deep space gateway, which will be a uh, lunar avant-post, uh, which will be around the moon, from which in 2024, this is the forecast, I believe it will be delayed, but there will be the mission uh, Artemis. Artemis means the first woman on the moon. And uh, this is in the program of NASA and uh, ESA. And start from that, uh, this deep uh, space gateway will be used not only to go up and down to the moon, but also as a starting point uh, for future space exploration, such as Mars, uh, after 2030. So this is what expects us. Of course, being in space uh, is not uh, uh, riskless. There are a lot of risks, a lot uh, of uh, problems to be solved. And NASA have categorized these problems into these big five clusters. So we have uh, radiation. I will talk just a little bit of it. Then we have a gravity field, which means the change in gravity. I will spoke mainly of this. Then we have also isolation, because uh, if you think in the context of a Mars mission, we will have uh, a uh, duration between 400 to 65, 60, 650 days uh, in which astronauts will be confined in the same environment, living together. So this could affect their behavior, their mental illness. And uh, so this is something that needs to be considered. Then we have a distance uh, which uh, impacts in telecommunication which means that astronauts will have to deal with themselves or using computer decision support systems in order to solve problems. They couldn't count uh, on the uh, ground support as usual. It was always, always done. For example, uh, in the moon, delay was about one second. So there was not this, uh, this problem. And fifth one, living in hostile closed environments uh, in which you don't have resources with you uh, for all your mission. So it means you have to recycle air, you have to recycle water, you have to grow on your own food, 
and this creates additional risks in terms of uh, uh, bacterial contamination, viruses uh, that uh, can then affect uh, health of uh, astronauts and uh, astronaut performance. And of course, a, uh, the possibility to go back uh, in case of problems uh, is not considered feasible. So this is the uh, panoramic of all the risks. In particular, if you look uh, for the gravity field, the uh, mission uh, to Mars involved also changing different gravities. So you'll have uh, the step from, of course, 1G to 0G, which will be maintained for about from six to nine months, according to the mission scenario. Then there will be the permanence on the Mars soil, which is uh, 3 8 of the Earth gravity. And uh, this will last uh, for another six to nine months. And then you have again the trip back, which will be subject again to zero G. And finally, you arrive home safely. So talking about gravity field, what is the main problem here? Well, the gravitational uh, fields affect the human body. And this depends on the G level, the duration of the stimulus, and uh, the body orientation. So every body of us perceives a different gravity if we are standing or we are laid down, of course. Why? Because uh, uh, what is uh, more sensitive to gravity changes is our cardiovascular system. And our cardiovascular system can be considered as a closed hydraulic circuit in which uh, the difference in pressure is generated by the difference in height by two points in your circuit. So, and this is generated, is regulated by the hydrostatic pressure gradient uh, formula, in which uh, the difference in pressure is function of the difference in height between the two points that you are considering. So, of course, if we are laying down, we have a constant pressure, let's say 100 millimeters of mercury, that our heart generates in order to push the blood to the feet and having the blood back to the brain, to the heart and the brain. And uh, what happens if we stand? Actually, when we stand, uh, there is this difference in height, which is perceived, which generates a uh, orthostatic, a hydrostatic pressure gradient between the heart and the brain. So it doesn't mean that the pressure in the brain will be less than the pressure that the heart uh, as uh, 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 started beating. Conversely, on the foot, we will have a higher pressure because we have a pressure generated by the heart plus this hydrostatic pressure gradient between the heart and the feet. Of course, this is normal. Everybody can uh, cope with this. And our system is done to perceive these changes to some sensors which are located on the aorta and on the carotids. So these are called baroceptors, and they perceive these changes in pressure, and they try to counteract this, for example, by increasing the heart rate. When we are standing, our heart rate is higher than we are lying down, or also generating some redistribution of the blood flow by contracting the peripheral, peripheral vasculature, so eliciting some baroceptive control. Okay, and this increase the venous return. So what happens when we have three Gs instead of one G? So this happens that this uh, orthostatic, hydrostatic pressure gradient is higher, and uh, the system is not able anymore alone to cope with uh, this uh, change in the gravitational field. And uh, instead, if you stay horizontal, we don't perceive this. At least we perceive as our body weights more, we perceive some pressure on our thorax, uh, if you are in this experimental condition, but in terms of the brain, the brain receives all the blood that it needs. So this is one of the reasons why, for example, astronauts are put in this position, both at uh, launch and re-entry, so that uh, the vector of acceleration is not head to foot, uh, but is uh, uh, transversal to the body. And uh, this is why, uh, why this? Because our body is made to resist more for gravity, which is uh, 
gravity changes which are transversal, while is less able to accommodate changes which are longitudinal, like head to foot. And what happens if uh, you have uh, higher gravity? Well, more blood stays into your bottom of the body, less blood comes to your head, so you can start having some problems. Uh, tunnel vision, gray vision, blackout, fainting, okay? So I show you an example. This was part of my certification to long-term space flight. This is me uh, some time ago. I was not gray hair. And uh, this is uh, the centrifuge, which is in Cologne. And uh, the run that I was doing here was 5G's head to foot, OK? I was already agitated because actually I had to repeat it because the first time that I did, I had gray vision. And so they said, OK, you have to repeat a second time. First time, I was really relaxed. Second time, I was not. As you can see, baseline heart rate 131. Also, in the centrifuge, when you start uh, feeling the Gs, uh, uh, you are recommended to do a kind of respiratory maneuver. This is what I'm doing, which is a kind of valsalva maneuver, which is uh, a maneuver that contracts your abdominal muscles. And in this way, you push your blood, which is into your lower extremities, up. So you help venous return by this uh, uh, respiratory maneuver. This is also what uh, uh, fighter jet pilots do uh, to counteract uh, some uh, particular maneuvers in which they can even elicit 9 to 10 Gs, but only for a few seconds. Okay? So you see my heart rate was up to 203, uh, so in the peak. But anyway, this for giving you an example that gravitational fields can be really effective on changing how our body performs. And this is important thinking of after an exploratory mission, when you stay for a long time in zero G, then you are back to a gravitational field, which is less than the Earth, is less than 5Gs, of course, apart the moment of landing, which could also be at higher Gs for shorter moments, but then you have to perform. You cannot recover. You don't have time to recover. So talking about space missions, this is uh, the updated uh, uh, integrated path to risk reduction by NASA. So NASA considers the five hazard classes that they showed before, and for each of them defines a specific risk. So for example, if we read, uh, we have the first two, which are space radiation exposure, which is a main risk nowadays for these kind of missions. Then we have other risks like cognitive behavior, inadequate food, team performance decrement, uh, renal stone formation, and so on. So for each of these risks, there are some um, uh, milestones that uh, are supposed to be uh, reached in order to lower down the risk from red to yellow to green. OK? And I just want to notice you something, end of ISS. So we know ISS is orbiting, but at the end of 2024, ISS will not be anymore maintained by the United States, by NASA. So it means that it will not be taken down, but it will be used by commercial use. It will be rented for companies, uh, for as industrial uh, production, for example, of uh, uh, drugs, pharmaceuticals will be used for marketing purposes, uh, for space travel, in order in, for space uh, visitors, let's say. Okay, but this means that after 2024, the ISS will not be anymore used for research. Despite that, a lot of these uh, milestones require the ISS uh, to be reached. All the these triangles means milestones require ISS. We need the ISS experimentation in order to reach these milestones, to prove uh, hypotheses, to study this countermeasure. So we'll see what happens when we are getting closer to that point. But another thing is, it's not just the ISS. A lot of research can be done 
by ground-based uh, analogs. And we will see what ground-based analogs are. One word about radiation. So radiation is a, a very important risk because every day outside Earth orbit uh, is like one year of radiation on Earth at the sea level. So you can imagine the level of radiation to which the astronauts will be subjected going back and forth from Mars. Because there is not anymore the magnetic field of Earth that prevents uh, uh, from cosmic rays, X-rays, uh, solar flames. Uh, so all this radiation will be to the astronaut. And radiation can have uh, acute effects and chronic effects. What are more important here are the chronic effects. Because the dose will be uh, continuous every day, except the potential risk of high dose in case of solar flames. And uh, this could lead also to degenerative cardiac disease. This is a recent uh, study that shows uh, the uh, mortality of astronauts, comparing the uh, general population of the United States in the age range of the astronauts from 55 to 64 age old, years old, the lunar Apollo astronauts, they, they are the only ones that were exposed to radiation while going to the moon and back, and the other astronauts. So from this uh, statistics appears that effectively the lunar Apollo astronauts have more mortality in cardiovascular disease, disease than other astronauts. So this generates the hypothesis that this could be due also to degenerative cardiac disease. Because we know now that there is cardiotoxicity that is produced by radiation. This is uh, unfortunately a side effect of anti-cancer therapy. In particular, breast cancer. Now there are drugs that are very good to treat breast cancer, but this generate also high cardiotoxicity. So we solve one problem, we generate later probably another problem of heart failure. And this is what could happen in astronauts. And this is difficult to be detected immediately because there are, the early signs are very weak. So what you see is you already have the main signs after some months or even some years. So I was saying that ESS is not the only possible way to do research in space, in particular for biomedical research, if we want to study physio physiology, human physiology. And I would say it's not even the best. Why? You see here, it's extremely expensive. To go there, it costs now $75 million. This is what NASA paid the Russians for every passenger to the ISS. If you want to send instrumentation, it's about $18,000 uh, per kilo. So if you have a new instrument, consider that it will cost. Then we have a small number of subjects. There are only few astronauts on the ISS that are also experimenters. So they are not just volunteers, but they also sometimes have to do the experiment themselves. And the majority are males. So we don't have, uh, a, let's say, equal knowledge of uh, body physiology in terms of male or female for historical reasons. The majority of astronauts were males. Uh, we have also different mission durations. Some astronauts stay three months, some stay six months, some stay one year. And uh, uh, research, the time for research is only a little time of the astronaut schedule because we have a lot to do in order to stay alive to maintain the station properly working. Finally, there is a lack of specific medical experience. It's very rare that there is a physician on board. And this also impacts on the quality of data that can be collected. There is no control group because everybody is doing exercise countermeasure. All the astronauts have to do two hours of exercise every day. Uh, finally, you have to deal with uh, and to count only on the onboard instrumentation. And sometimes there are non-scientific issues. For example, we as a European, unless there is a bilateral agreement, cannot access the Russian cosmonauts in terms of getting the data from them 
or the um, American cosmonauts. There has to be specific agreements between NASA, uh, Russia, ESA, in order to access the astronaut. So ground-based studies. What are the ground-based studies? I will talk more extensively about the power body flights and bed rest, which are the ones that I was able to participate, but they are not the only ones. Uh, mainly, the ground analogs include the immobilization, unloading, and isolation. These are the three factors that uh, can be studied. Uh, for example, for immobilization, uh, we have also dry immersion, which is a different version of bed rest in which uh, you are immersed in a, let's say, little pool, but uh, separated from the, the liquid, of course. Uh, or for unloading, not only parabolic flight, but there is uh, the limb suspension, which is usually what is used in animals, in rats. You just put the rat with one limb suspended for a month and see what happens. Uh, for men, it can also be used as suspending one uh, leg, for example, or uh, to simulate, for example, uh, walking uh, uh, on the moon surface or the Mars surface, uh, there are systems that uh, um, reduce your weight bearing. So they are partial weight bearing uh, uh, devices in order for you to perceive less weight while you simulate uh, motion. And for isolation, there are uh, Concordia Station at the South Pole, where usually people are confined during the winter, the polar winter. Uh, but also there are the, this is the model of the nuclear submarines in which uh, uh, people are confined for three months in a very, let's say, similar condition to what that could be a mission to Mars. Huh? Uh, or there are specific habitats that have been built in order to uh, receive a limited group of people in order to study, in particular, their behavior, relationships, and reaction during long-term uh, permanence. Maybe some of you have heard about Mass 500, uh, in which they put uh, six people for 520 days inside one of these habitats in Moscow for study them for all the duration, the potential duration of a Mars mission, 520 days. Kind of crazy if you think about it. But volunteers, uh, people are always available to do this uh, kind of thing. Somebody because they want to become an astronaut. So this can be a very good uh, line on your CV if you participated to this uh, kind of uh, study. So parabolic flight. Parabolic flight are used to simulate, well, to generate, actually, the immediate effects of weightlessness. What happens as soon as you get zero G? And uh, this is what happens. You have uh, your 100 millimeters of mercury of pressure, which are uh, in all your body, besides the fact that you're not anymore horizontal. You are vertical. And in particular, this generates a, a movement uh, of uh, load of fluids from the feet to the upper torso and your head. In fact, this is known for astronauts after the first day. We have this kind of facial puffiness because more liquids are up in the head and the torso. So what happens with parabolic flight? You have this kind of trajectory in which uh, the plane uh, goes up and launches itself in a ballistic trajectory. So there are no more uh, contact forces. There are only non-contact forces. And what you experiment is uh, weightlessness. You are in free fall for 20 seconds. And this is uh, followed and perceived by an hypergravity phase of about 20 seconds. And uh, usually this uh, is uh, utilized. OK, uh, how does it work? Because the pilot is able to uh, compensate the drag with the thrust and to null the lift. So the plane is not flying anymore during the apex of a parabola. Okay? It's not stalling because it cannot fly. It's just launching itself in a ballistic trajectory. And this is done uh, usually, a campaign includes uh, three days of flight, 31 parabolas 
uh, per day with two minutes between one and the other one. It's a lot of fun unless you get sick. Then it's the worst thing you can imagine because you're going to vomit for 31 parabolas continuously, OK? Three hours of flight. Usually it doesn't happen, but I've seen some cases. And uh, in terms of physiology, this uh, generates a uh, acute, non-pharmacological induced, uh, reversible, uh, and repeatable change in preload. What is preload? Venous return. So the fact that you have more blood coming back uh, to the heart. Okay. And uh, the aim, usually, of uh, research to done in parabolic flight is uh, to test instrumentation before instrumentation is going to be sent to the ISS. So to test your, uh, let's say, experimental design, also what the astronauts should do. And also, we used it to study immediate effects of, of physiology at zero g. And uh, to do this, we wanted to study imaging. I do research since my master thesis on cardiovascular system, so I'm interested in the cardiovascular system. And uh, actually, imaging is the only, well, echocardiography is the only imaging modality on board the ISS. Since the beginning, since before the ISS, uh, in the Salyut 6, there was the first um, ultrasound system that was used to start studying physiology at zero-g by the Russians. Now, you see the dimensions that was all the rack, the full rack for the first ultrasound equipment. Now, on board, they have uh, a uh, portable equipment, which is the same that you can find in hospitals to, to take an echo machine, to take an echo from, from you. And uh, this was our uh, experimental setup in which we studied the subject standing in order to maximize the shifts in the blood. Then we have a echo machine, which changed over time. We had a, a non-invasive arterial pressure to have this ECG. And you can see that the subject is inside a cylinder, which is a lower body negative pressure chamber. What is a lower body negative chamber? Is a, a, a sealed uh, chamber in which uh, a suction can be generated by sucking out air at the minus 50 millimeters of mercury of pressure. And this is uh, considered a potential countermeasure to keep the blood in the legs. So we wanted to test this countermeasure in order to see if it was able to keep the blood down, so to prevent venous return increase during the zero G phase. If you start it during the 2G, the subject faints because you increase, uh, you have a less venous reduction due to hypergravity plus with minus 50, which generates a big gradient in pressure, OK? So we start this only during 0G. And uh, we use the different uh, imaging uh, techniques that uh, echocardiography is able to, to give you. I just show you some uh, pictures. OK, this is a carotid, a, a vascular echo, where you can see the jugular vein and the carotid artery. And this is a conventional uh, four-chamber view of a heart. Uh, for the ones that are not used to, I just put the initials. So you see the left ventricle, the right ventricle, left atrium, and right atrium. OK? So in the movies, you can see the trace below is the ECG. And the trace in the middle, you see 0 g, 1 g, 2 g. The trace in the middle corresponds to the level of gravity. And there, you can see what, maybe with this light, we will not see very much, but you can see the horizon change to the parabola. So it's what you see if you look out of a window. Just to sh show you the effects when you are experimenting zero g. So let's see. Movies should be kind of synchronized. Let's see if they work. So once we enter in two g's, this one is starting. So this is hypergravity. Gravity is raising up. The plane is uh, climbing. And then at a certain point, it will enter into zero g at the top of the parabola. 
and look at the jugular vein as a first. OK. So that is already the fact that the blood is going up to the artery and is going down to the heart. OK? And also, in the heart, you can see a dilation of the ventricle and, in particular, of the left atrium. Because you have all this blood that comes from the periphery to the portal vein into the right side of the heart, go into the lungs, and then goes into the left uh, side of the heart. And then as soon as you go back to the hypergravity, the situation goes back. This uh, venous return is immediately reduced. Okay? This is what uh, gravitational field can do on, uh, on our body. And uh, for example, we studied Doppler. You can see here, this is the, Doppler, the flow between the ventricle and the atrium, left side of the heart. You have a flow that goes from the left atrium to the left um, ventricle. This is the transmitral Doppler flow. And it's composed by two waves. One is called E wave, the other called A wave. The E wave is uh, as soon as the valve is opening, you have also a suctional uh, effect from the ventricle, which kind of sucks the blood from the atrium. While the A wave is generated by the fact that uh, in the contraction, the atrium is contracting before the ventricle. So first, the heart, every beat, the atrium is contracting, the ventricle is contracting. So in the contraction of the atrium, you have, again, another push to the ventricular volume. It's feeling a little bit more. And you can see here that going to zero G, what we could uh, uh, find is that, in particular, the physiology that was main affected was the first part of the diastole, which is this uh, rapid feeling phase, it's called. And uh, the increase was of the order of more than 50%. Instead, when uh, we activated the LBMP, the pressure chamber, our countermeasure, effectively, this was uh, reduced. You cannot find differences compared to baseline. So also, we studied uh, the uh, cardiac volumes. You can see here the ventricular curve uh, of uh, the, in this case, the area, because we had a 2D image at 1G, then you have it at uh, 2G, and then you have at 0G, where the area is increased. So this means that you have a more dilated ventricle. But uh, again, when the countermeasure was activated, this effect was reduced a lot. But this has a limitation. It's a 2D echo. 2D echo has a limitation that is related to the plane you're imaging. It's just one slice. While our body, our heart, is three-dimensional. So what we did was to apply 3D echo. This is a fish inside a ball, just for you to see. And uh, 3D echo is nowadays available. If you go and take a cardiac exam, probably the machine that uh, the physician is using is a 3D echo machine. Okay? At that time, we were in 2000. Oops. 2004, we had the first prototype of 3D echo machine from Philips that we were able to put into a plane in order to do 3D echo during parabolic flight. And uh, well, you can see here a little bit of zero gravity in action. So while the volunteer is uh, playing, we are working, in particular the sonographer and me to try to acquire the data and uh, control the settings of the machine. But anyway, what we found that was that the changes that uh, we could see with 2D in reality were bigger than what we could see only in two dimension. And uh, in particular, the volumes of the ventricle was increased by 20%. And surprisingly, the volume of the atrium was increased up to 40%. So our atrium is like a balloon that is able to compensate a lot of changes uh, in the blood that comes back. That was kind of uh, impressive. And again, if we use the countermeasure, this was able to counteract these uh, uh, big changes. Another uh, study that we did with was uh, uh, with ballistocardiography. 
So if you look at this uh, uh, CT scan, you see the flow that originates from the heart and goes down into the aorta, well, first up to the aortic arch and then down to the abdominal aorta. And then up, it goes to the carotid, and then you see the blood coming back from the jugular veins. Okay? So what happens if you measure with some accelerometer put on your body, or you stay on a very sensitive uh, um, scale? What is happening is that this 80 millimeters of blood that goes up and down generate changes in your body weight. Okay? Your body is not weighting the same. So you can measure this, and this is at the base of a ballistocardiography. You can measure the oscillations that the beat, the cardiac beat generates on your body as recoil forces. So the idea was, OK, let's do this to monitor cardiac performance in astronauts during space flight. Of course, this works even better if you are in free floating because you, are not, uh, uh, you don't have uh, contact forces. So you are free to oscillate in space. So this could be used to monitor not only the cardiac beat, but also cardiac contractility. If you have circulatory problems, for example, one side of your body uh, is working with some problems compared to the other. So we did this uh, in two parabolic flights. This is our uh, experimental setup. And this is an example of our experiment. So the subject is uh, laying down. So we are here at zero G. And then the subject is left free floating for some seconds without touching any surface. Of, unfortunately, the, the plane is a, a limited volume. So this uh, ends up after a while. And then, of course, you have a return to, to G. And you can see here the uh, signals that we were able to acquire. And uh, we were able to acquire for the longest parabola, we did 18 bits, in which we were able to have uh, the non-contact forces, so generated only by the heart, as a displacement uh, of the body during the floating. This is uh, to be studied into the International Space Station right now. But also, we have something that uh, we perceived on ground. Because we thought that also our body can measure vibrations. In particular, everything you have now in your hands or your pocket is a smartphone as accelerometers. So if you put your accelerometer on your thorax, this is called seismocardiography, you can see actually the carrier beats. And so you can monitor, we tested it. Recently, this is my PhD that uh, just uh, got their PhD. You can monitor heart rate, respiration, and also to measure stress during this, uh, using this signal without any wearable. Huh? And then another idea came. Yes, but so the blood is going up to our head. Our head is free to move, OK, apart from the neck but keeps it. So what uh, is uh, possible? to be used to measure these movements of the head. Well, you can see an example here. This is an amplified motion of a head movement due to cardiac beat. So every body of us has this, OK? So that our eyes are not uh, good enough to detect this motion. But if you have a device that can detect this motion, you can measure it. So this is a, my student that is going to graduate tomorrow. I st stole a couple of slides. And what we are we using? We are using a virtual reality headset. Because there are uh, accelerometers in it, gyroscopes. So through that, we can actually estimate very well the, car the heart rate and also respiration, by the way. And why this can be useful? Because uh, not only for Medicine, where now artificial uh, augmented reality or virtual reality are used, uh, for example, to decrease stress in an hospital settings, but in particular for kids that have to be hospitalized for a long time, but also for astronauts, because uh, 
virtual reality is thought as a way to uh, counteract uh, the confinement. So if you are confined for three years, uh, you need to see something different every while. So what is best that giving you a virtual reality experience? And through that, we can monitor actually the astronauts while they are having this experience to see if it's effective or not, to measure. So going back to what happens after zero G, if you stay long time in uh, space, actually for more than one day, some mechanisms start acting on your body. We said about the radi reduced hydrostatic gradient, uh, which generates the uh, Edward shift of uh, fluid. Oops. Also, we have a redistribution of circulating blood towards the thorax. But this also generates some uh, reaction from your carotid baroceptors that uh, perceive too much blood to the brain. So what changes? Renal function is affected. You are not drinking anymore and peeing more. So this is a way to reduce uh, the liquid part of your blood volume because you don't need it anymore. So this uh, leads to loss of extracellular and intracellular fluids and reduce total blood volume. Then then is uh, uh, aff affecting the blood pressure, blood pressure is low, and the cardiac function, contractility is reduced. So all this happens after two days of space flight. Then of course you have also the right part when you have a reduced loading and disuse of uh, the bones, the muscles, that generates a lot of potential negative effects. So atrophy, skeletal muscles, uh, loss of bone, demineralization. Uh, you also lose the movement coordination because uh, your brain is used to take into account gravity in the model of our perception. And this has been shown, actually, that uh, it goes up to change the functional connectivity in the brain. So there is a brain remodeling after months in space. It's not just a change in motor schemes, but it's because your brain is remodeled. Visual disorders, actually this happens in space. And this is generated by the increase of this intracranial pressure. And this is a main problem because astronauts that didn't have uh, glasses need glasses while they are on the ISS. And this could also stay when they go back. Cardiovascular deconditioning, loss of orthotic, orthostatic tolerance, meaning you cannot stay stand, reduced maximum exercise capacity and general performance. If you have to run to make an effort, you cannot do as before. And lower tolerance to IGs. This is important in case of IGs for landing or re-entry, uh, your tolerance is low. So if you think about all these negative effects really impact the body on, only when you are readmitted into gravity. Because while you are in zero G, nothing on this is per se a negative effect, a part of a visual disorder, which makes a difference. But all of these problems uh, are a problem when you have to go back in a gravitational field and start working, OK? But per se, you could live with less bones. You don't need legs in space. You could live with less muscles. You don't use the legs muscles. You just use the arm muscles. Uh, of course, it impacts a little bit the general performance, because in particular, when you have to do a space walk, the body is really stressed. So that is the, the part uh, where your body is, is phys physically stressed. So how to cope with this? Physical countermeasures, physical exercise. These are three devices that uh, have been taken on board the ISS and been designed specifically to allow different kinds of exercises in order to cope with this uh, problem and try to keep the astronaut as best of his performance. What happens when uh, you go back into 
a gravitational field. Well, this is uh, what happens. Your heart is used to beat in an environment with no gravity, with less fluid circulating. So when you go back, your pressure is very low. And uh, the blood doesn't reach the brain in a, a considered, considerable amount. So you have this kind of effect. This was only after 12 days of space flight in a shuttle mission. So you can see she's talking. And then after a while, she starts having some problems. And they have to help because she cannot stand anymore. And this is generated by these causes. So redu reduction in circulating blood and uh, uh, interstitial fluid volumes. Blood pressure is low. Stroke volume, which is ejected blood or TDV beat, is low. Uh, and uh, the barrel sectors are not able anymore to counteract this. So bed rest is uh, a space analog that allows to study long-term permanence to space flight. So people are put in bed with a head down, minus 6 degrees, from 5 to 60 days. This generates uh, a positive hydrostatic pressure uh, towards the head in order to generate the fluid redistribution, which simulates the space flight fluid redistribution. And this uh, uh, setup allows to test countermeasures. So usually, uh, these studies are can be of short duration, five days, mid duration, 21 days. In this case, the design is a crossover. What does it mean? The same subject is a control of himself. He does the bed rest twice, or even three times, with some month in between. So we have this subject that redid the bed rest for 21 days, three times, with six month difference. And they were allocated to a control group once, then to a countermeasure the second time, and to another countermeasure the third time. This is very good from a statistical point of view, because you can apply paired statistics to study the effects uh, of the subjects. And uh, so you can reduce a lot the number of uh, subjects in order to have statistical significance. Instead, when uh, the bed rest is longer for 60 days. You cannot ask the people to come back and do another time in 60 days bed rest. Also because you take one or two years to go back to the normal, let's say, physiological uh, uh, background that you had before, in terms of bones in particular, bones and muscles. So you have only a control group and a countermeasure group. So you need more subjects to try to uh, see the real effects of a countermeasure. And they dichotomize them from the effect of the bed rest. Usually there is a pre and post phase in which the subject is available for being studied. And these, uh, these studies are done in Toulouse at MEDES, Medicine Espacial, as part of CNES, or at uh, uh, DLR in Cologne, in Germany. In Italy, you have to go there. Uh, there are some limitations, of course, of these studies. The first one is the possible interactions between experiments. When you do this kind of studies, you're not the only one. So you can see on the line, the, the different rows are different subjects. If you move on the line, you can see the schedule of a subject for one day of bed rest. And the different colors are the different experiments. So you can imagine that you could have some interactions with other experiments that could have been done before yours. And you have to cope with this or try to minimize this in the planning of all the design. It takes a year to plan this kind of studies. Uh, we have multiple meetings between all the groups, 10 to 12 groups of investigators uh, that come from all around the world uh, in order to design at best uh, the experiment uh, design. And uh, also other limitations. Usually, you have artificial light. They are done in confinement spaces. Lack of privacy for the subjects. So there is a risk of dropout. 
And uh, uh, for a long term bed rest, as I said, uh, uh, there is not the, the subject is not a control of himself. So you need more subjects, more number, in order to have a significant data. Which countermeasures have been uh, tested in these years? Well, nutrition. Nutrition is uh, one of the main countermeasures, uh, not for cardiovascular, but uh, for other systems. For cardiovascular and muscle and skeletal, uh, resistive as a size plus uh, uh, body vibration. So the subject has a feet on a uh, platform which vibrates, and while he is uh, in this position, he has to do squats, of course, in horizontal position. Or, again, this is a sledge jump system that allows to uh, perform some uh, hops and jumps while you are horizontal. There's a kind of a sledge that uh, is, uh, generates a pressure against the shoulders of uh, the subject so that the subject is able to counteract jumping and then is pushed again back on uh, the platform. So from a mechanical engineer, this is not a simple design, but these machines are very incredible for what they can do. And finally, the short term centrifugation. So the idea is let's replicate gravity by spinning the subject, by uh, adding an uh, angular rotation. Of course, in this way, the gravity is not constant, but is proportional to the distance to the center of rotation. There were some concepts that are the early concepts. And nowadays, we have this kind of device, which is the one of the DLR in Germany. And the, uh, the question that now we have it, how much every day, in which modality, continuous, intermittent, uh, potentially, you should combine this with physical exercise, but this generates problems due to motion sickness. Because unless uh, your head is not moving, you're fine. If your head moves, uh, you have a corioli effect that affects your autolytes, your vestibular system, and so you start uh, having a lot of problems. If everybody of you has even, ever tried the rotating chair experiment, uh, probably nobody, lucky you, uh, you have this kind of uh, uh, vestibular problems in which you feel your body in a completely different configuration. So your eyes are telling you another thing. And this conflict generates uh, the brain to try to shut down in some way, which means the first effect is vomiting. OK? So we are actually participating to a campaign that is ending in these days of 60 days in which we study artificial gravity. And uh, here is a view inside the centrifuge, just to show you how fast it is. So it makes one rotation every two seconds. So it was accelerating a little bit, and now it is uh, full speed. And the subjects are staying here half an hour a day in our protocol, doing nothing. But the idea would be to add, in the future campaigns, uh, to add exercise. So it's fast. So just uh, to finish uh, a little hint of what I'm trying to find in these years uh, in this, uh, with these settings, a perfect zero G for the bed rest. Our hypothesis was that uh, all these modifications could affect the cardiac structure, and that could predispose the heart to have uh, some arrhythmi arrhythmogenity. So to have uh, not anymore an electrical activity which is uh, normal, but have some episodes uh, that uh, could eventually elicit some bigger damages. For example, ventricular tachycardia, ventricular fibrillation, cardiac arrest. So the question was, could long-term exposure to weightlessness 
influence cardiac remodeling and in some way generating the condition to have cardiac dysproportions. And it's possible with countermeasures to prevent this. Uh, this is uh, confirmed, actually, this risk by some evidence in previous space flight in which there were some reported cases. Of course, you have to, you have to think astronauts are healthy subjects, super controlled. So apparently, they are completely normal when they fly. But besides that, uh, the environment, the condition, the stress uh, could generate these kind of problems. And uh, some episodes are reported. This one is reported in a paper. And also the Russians have reported some uh, problems. And uh, somebody computed the risk of cardiac arrest during space flight, which is 1% every year. So for a space flight of six months, we have 0.5% risk of cardiac arrest, which is not negligible. Also thinking that when you have a cardiac arrest, you have six minutes to reanimate the person. If not, your brain is dead. And on Earth, you fall. People can see you falling down. On the ISS, in microgravity, you're not falling. Nobody is realizing you're having a cardiac arrest because nobody's falling down. So this generates an additional risk to detect a cardiac arrest in space. Also, some uh, drugs uh, that help the crew to optimize performance uh, are related to increased risk, risk of sudden death. So there are the conditions. Some MRI done before and after flight also showed some cardiac atrophy, which could be the symptom that we were, let's say, accompanying to the electrical problem. So we say there's some structural change, and this structural change is a condition by which you can have also an electrical problem. So this was our setup. We participated to a series of bed rests in this last six years. We did uh, ECG, and we did imaging, sometimes with echo, and sometimes with MRI, according to the facility, to the budget, because you have to pay yourself these uh, experiments. And uh, uh, the idea was, in terms of uh, uh, arrhythmogenesis evaluation, to focus on the, what is called ventricular repolarization, which is the T wave on the ECG, this wave here, which is uh, the wave which is generated by the cells uh, when they return to the pre-excitatory condition. So after the systole, systole the cell contracts and then returns to a state in which it can contract again. So when this happens in all the cells of the heart, you have this T wave which is regenerated at the level of the ECG. What is the problem? The problem is if some cells repolarize before, some cells after. So this increases the time in which if you have a, it's called a re-entry circuit, you can have an arrhythmia. And this can generate problems. And also we computed alternance. What we found? Well, we found one episode. Of one subject had 23 seconds of ventricular tachycardia after bed rest while it was in control group. So it's enough to say that our hypothesis were confirmed. No, but at least in our population, we found one normal subject that had this problem. And then we found some signs of augmented heterogeneity and also, in particular, we found signs of increased risk when gravity is restored. Not during bed rest, but when gravity is restored. And also, in terms of imaging, we found uh, that uh, in terms of flows, everything is restored rapidly after bed rest. What is not restored as rapidly, in particular after 60 days, is the left ventricular mass. So there is a sign of remodeling which goes in the direction of our hypothesis, that the structure of the heart is changing, and this can elicit additional risks uh, when gravity is restored after space flight or after landing, if you imagine, to the moon or to Mars. Okay, this is where we are. Actually, we have just uh, 
been admitted to other two experimental opportunities that will last for the next three years, in which we will collect data from astronauts before and after missions, both short missions or even long missions, up to six months, in order to study better this uh, phenomenon to MRI. So maybe in some years we can update our results based on what we found here. So I'm done. And uh, as you can see, it's not a one-man uh, show. It's a, a big effort, uh, both internationally and also in terms of uh, Polytechnic. I had the uh, lucky to have uh, students interested in these uh, topics. So to do PhDs or to do thesis, master thesis, uh, and of course, uh, funding from uh, the Italian Space Agency, if not, uh, ev everything of this uh, could not have this uh, possible. So thank you for your attention. I think I went a little bit long. But uh, if you have uh, questions, curiosities, now is the time to raise your hand. <laughs>